Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the GBYWN Australia podcast. I am your host, as per usual, Aston Crude, and I believe this is episode 88 or 89 of the podcast. I'm aiming for 100, and uh, before I bring on my guest, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I still uh, plan to interview Vincent Graves at some point soon. I'd also like to interview Arthur Aries and Big Ace. Um, I'd like to get a second interview in with um, the little fuckhead Luke Monet. And uh, I also want to do a Resolution 5 review show with a bunch of the guys. Um, it's been some time now, but uh, you know I've been meaning to do that for since the last show, which was about seven months ago. Uh, and of course, I, I do need to make the time to going down to Bunbury to uh, spend a couple of days with Mykonos to record an interview with him, which I've been saying that I wanted to do since the very first podcast that I did. And that person who I interviewed on my first episode is here again today. Ladies and gentlemen, this man is the longest reigning WZWA heavyweight champion in history with the most title defenses and I believe the longest reigning heavyweight champion in WA yarding history. Uh, I'm not counting the three-year reign that I had as XCW champion because we didn't have any fucking shows. Um, he's a former XCW tag team champion, television champion, WCWA tag team champion, GBYW and Australian tag team champion. He's an Australian backyard wrestling hall of famer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the all-American Australian Badass, simply sensational, rookie sensation, hardcore Blade Shaw. Blade, how are you going today, mate? Uh, so good, man. It's um, it's awesome being here and catching up with you and stuff. I, I'm really looking forward to getting into this. So let's do it. Let's do it, bro. Um, uh, you know, first thing I want to say is, is I feel almost a bit sad um, about uh, this interview because, as far as I'm concerned, you're my favorite person to interview. <laughs> um, we always have a, a good time when we do it, um, d dating back to when we got really drunk, uh, doing it the first time in person, yeah. but also the times just over Skype when we would be, you know, doing a review show or whatever. Um, so you're one of my favorite interview, uh, interviews to do here. And it's just a bit sad in a way thinking this is probably the last time we'll do this. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's any other reason we'd have to, uh, have a conversation be recorded, but um, just wanted to put that out there. It's just a bit sad for me, um, but exciting at the same time. I yeah. get to do this with you, bro. Uh, how have things uh, uh, been with you at the, in the last seven months? Um, to be honest, really, really difficult. Um, as you know, I recently lost my job and I lost my grandfather uh, about a month ago now. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the back end of 2017 has not not been particularly great for me, but I think that it also kind of encapsulates uh, a lot about me, right? It's like I've always kind of been the guy that has faced a lot of adversity. Like, yeah. I've been through a lot of shit. Um, not that that's a cool thing to brag about. Like, I feel like I'm bragging. But it's like, it really, like, I, I have been through a lot of shit. And... Um, you know, I think this is just another another low, but I always come out of them. Um, there's You're always a fighter, bro. Yeah, definitely. Like, like Christina Aguilera sings about. <laughs> a fighter. She would know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I um, yeah. So not not great, but it's stuff like this. Um, you know, things like wrestling um, that have kind of kept me. I don't know, upbeat. I guess. Yeah. There's there's a silver lining. Yeah, I think it's difficult for a lot of the guys, you know, a lot of the guys have been having a, a bit of a hard time since WCWA ended, and um, they don't have the outlet of the wrestling anymore, mm. which is, you know, something that they all used, I believe, used quite um, very much so to help themselves get through everyday life. It, it was always like a, a way to, I don't know, get away from the bullshit of, of the world. Well, that's it, like, and... You know, we always use it as somewhere that we could express ourselves and kind of be free from, you know, all the shit that was sort of going on in our lives for a few hours. We'd come together and, you know, like all that shit wouldn't matter. Um, yeah. And you kind of, you lose that support network as well. I mean, you know, these were people that 
at the time you were guaranteed to see at minimum at least once a month and you know you're yeah. always actively talking and all that sort of stuff and in a way yeah it's sad because we've we've kind of lost a little bit of that um you know it's natural life takes people in different directions and yeah but i miss it a lot yeah me too and you know i think it's the same for any backyard wrestling group you know uh the guys from over east i think you know once they stopped doing it they probably didn't really see each other that much anymore yeah um it's a, it's sad in a way that that was the only reason we ever did come together but hopefully you know with certain weddings and uh <laughs> fucking babies being made uh oh hopefully there'll be a bucks party yeah for two certain individuals in the wzwa <laughs> um so let's get on to it uh blade um where we left off uh, yes. Last time I interviewed you, you were about to have that career-changing last man standing match with Ryan Tate uh, at Hardcore Hell 2015, which in my opinion is the unofficial match of the year. Should be, though. I've said it many times. Um, the first question I had about this match was what was the planning process like going into it? Because I'm interested to know because I don't think you had had a Hardcore-style match since XCW. I yeah. can't even remember anything yeah. like that happening so and that, that wasn't really a hardcore match in XCW it's just fucking throwing someone in a cardboard acid boxes. rain I think it was out you against acid rain and he was just throwing you around on John Sandy fucking backyard and <laughs> I don't think you guys even use weapons but what was the planning process like with Ryan um really like really meticulous I mean you've wrestled Ryan before so you know what it's like you know what he's like when it comes to planning he likes to have a game plan um and we sort of we knew obviously that it was a big match for both of us so we wanted to uh you know pull out stuff that people hadn't seen before um you know like me debuting the end of days as my new finisher and um the 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 one and only because i'm a big billy gun mark uh onto the apron and like the DDT off the apron just all that kind of yeah. stuff we wanted to make spots that people be like oh shit like I haven't seen these guys do that before um, and then on the other the hardcore side of it we kind of mostly just improvised like we had the spots uh, like when he knee dropped me off the ladder through the, the, right. the chairs yeah. um, and all that kind of stuff but some of it yeah came uh, as a mass improvisation like a lot of the chair stuff and, and right. all that kind of shit um, yeah, it just it was just crazy that match. Uh, uh, well, what are your thoughts and memories of the match? I mean, um, we'll get to the All American Australian gimmick in a minute, but yeah. um, you know, just as it's taking place, you know, I guess <clears throat> what I one, what I really want to say is is that there was a lot of pressure going into you on this match because I had said to you that I'm still fifty fifty whether or not you're winning the belt at Resolution mm. Four because you need to start being able to have main event caliber matches just specifically for the fact that if I give you that spot I want all the other boys to say Blade earned it Blade yeah. deserves this spot I don't want them to think oh he's only getting it because Carl wants him to win the title Yeah, I wanted them to really believe it and be behind you <clears throat> which the gimmick did help with but um, there was a lot of pressure on you going into this to you know be a 10 times the Blade Shaw you have been over the last 15 years yeah i think it's um you're you're definitely right so you've got the the it was such a like a culmination of events you've got the gimmick side which you know unproven untested we're like oh we think this is a great idea so who knows how that could go yeah and then you've got the match which like you said i haven't wrestled a hardcore match really ever uh and then yeah you've also got a guy like ryan who you know everybody respects always has a good quality match with everybody so if i don't have a good match with him yeah and that kind of proves like what, shit well what the fuck is wrong with you yeah exactly so um it was just crazy you know i debuted a new gimmick massive pop ever uh, like automatically yeah. over we start wrestling and like up until that point I kind of always had like little spots throughout my matches where people would be like you know there would be a pop but like we actually managed I think to keep 
everybody interested from start to finish. Yeah, and last man standing matches are hard to do that with. Yeah, because there's that you know there's that down period where you're playing up the psychology of like oh we're both fucked up like trying yeah. to get to our feet and it, it can be kind of boring and tedious but. Like, I think we managed to craft it in such a way that, yeah, and, and working Lily in and everything as well, like, exactly. I think it just, it, it all came together nicely, and um, oh, I'm so glad it went the way that it did, because, yeah, like you've said many times, you feel like it's unofficially the match of the year, um, and it was my career-defining match at that point, like, strapped you to the rocket that sent you up to the stratosphere baby <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I was watching my last man standing match with Mike Del Carno from 2014 and fucking no crowd reaction except for like the finish of the match when I outsiders edged him onto yeah. the gate in the corner it was dead and, and I was like fuck like this is actually a pretty good match and no one is like invested in, in, in it and I didn't understand why um, but then I watched that last man standing match and I'm like that's how you do one like so I was fucking proud that you know you guys were able to take that stipulation but keep it interesting the whole way through from start to finish um, <clears throat> so obviously the, the, the next question is about the all American Australian gimmick um, I can't quite remember again how uh, the idea came about it, there was something to do with your ICWS gimmick being the law blade shore and you made a comment about America, right? Truth, justice, and the American way. Yeah, that's what that I was got there a, to lay got down. a massive fault when you said yeah. it. Yeah, like, it was really good, and I, I don't know if I said something like you need to do something like that in WCW way, and then you came up with the fucking Superman and Captain America and mm. and all that stuff. So how did you? Yeah, right. So um, I'll circle this back into a little bit because I, I kind of just realized, like at the end of the snippet of the match that I wanted to talk about was oh, right. the bleeding part. Like Ooh. that was such a, that was such a big part. Shit, I totally forgot um, about that. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Sorry. I'll, and I'll circle back. So we, we have the, we have like kind of the end of the match. We're going into the end stretch and I have taken like a lot of licks at this point. Like people <laughs> were like, I was taking a beating, like the kick in the head in the corner, <laughs> like where my neck snaps back yeah, and yeah, like, it's fucked up. I was getting beaten and uh, we have this chair spot so we're both wrestling over a chair and I am supposed to pick it up hold it in front of my face brace and Ryan kicks it does his short super kick yeah. into my face being that I was kind of like a bit tired at this point because we've been going for like over 20 minutes yeah. I uh, I start to get up but I haven't pulled the chair quite and braced Shit, it okay. so he flies through with the kick and it smacks me like full on in the face that's fine but with those chairs there's like a little metal catch at the side where they right, fold out yeah. and so that's caught my like skin on my eyebrow and right. just ripped up and so then blood just like starts I'm I go full crimson mask basically <laughs> like yeah. it within 30 seconds and so I'm getting to my feet and I'm like I feel this I can feel the drip like right. I can kind of hear it red, in the moment red. and I'm like I look down I'm like what the fuck and then I see red and I'm like oh shit I'm bleeding and that's so, not big red, that's blood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I've got to sell this. So I like, uh, started to squeeze out like the blood so more was coming. I'm like, I need to, you know, fully embrace what's going on because, it, you know, it's such a swerve. Because um, we don't get blood very often in WCW, but when it happens, everyone gets more invested because it becomes a bit more real. And it, and it just made it so, seem like such more of a battle like you know yeah. it's like a war like somebody's bled um and you haven't bladed this is the hard way yeah you know? so like i've actually been legit busted open um and it was so awesome because you've got like me at the end you know i'm slumped in the corner and there's just blood like everywhere um so you know like we have a little bit <laughs> i'm bleeding at the end and then you've got esqualito comes out with lila <laughs> so i'm kind of standing there like in this segment oh, just blood everywhere well. Shit. um and so you know you and you and Lila do your little bit, and then I jump out of the ring, go to the back, and everyone's like, "Oh shit!" So like Ice and a couple of the guys are like cleaning me up and you know get me a band aid and all that stuff, and I'm like, "Man, Jade is gonna fucking kill me!" Like <laughs> she goes, she's, she was always like, "You guys, you know, you guys do stupid shit," and then like I get cut open, so I was like, "I know she's gonna like fucking 
get stuck into me for that and then I was also worried about my gear because I just bought it and there was like blood getting on my gear and I was like fuck so it was really bizarre but um yeah it just I think it was like the icing on the cake of that match right like it just it really was and I think the fact that you bled it, it I think it made people um gain this respect for you yeah like fuck like Blade fucking went all out there and, and he really proved himself here today and I think that actually helped in, in, yeah. in the long run yeah definitely um, so the all American Australian gimmick to, yeah. answer, to answer your previous question so I came to you when you told me that you kind of had this idea that I do want you to win the heavyweight title but you know you need to get fit you need to you know like work on your in ring work blah 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 like cool okay i mean i i know initially i'd said to you like i'm actually very hesitant like i didn't want to win the belt yeah um but once you kind of told me like no this is what we're doing and you know i I want you to do this so i kind of went away tried to think of an idea the original idea that formed was um i wanted to do like a like a pop culture gimmick so it was like i would you know, like reference movies and my promos and like steal famous lines from movies um, and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, you know, this is an interesting idea. But then with the ICWS stuff, I kind of came in and was wearing the Captain America t-shirt and sort of like made the reference and it got over. I know we talked about that and you're like, oh, I think there's there's something we can do here. Yeah. And like I'm a huge Captain America and Superman fan. You know, I love those like ultimate good guys um so we we kind of looked at that and we're like okay well let's do that but we're gonna like sort of satirize like that that thing right like it's it's stupid there's like ridiculously good guys like oh he's just so nice and like you know he he believes you know justice is the ultimate thing that you know that can happen and we sort of took that and and really like uh sort of centered up which was awesome um and i think it it definitely worked for like the sort of crowd that we were exactly I think to. if you're going to do it go all the way because it'll be so cheesy that it's awesome yeah uh, you, you know you can't just be a regular good guy you got to be like you know the good guy the, you know say your prayers eat your vitamins all yeah. that shit but like ham it up a little bit yeah it becomes very entertaining as opposed to being like a little bit ugh, like yeah yeah cringy yeah. like yeah um <clears throat> i think there's a lot of problems with a lot of baby faces this these days is, is take themselves a bit too seriously in the role and if i think they're a bit more entertaining with themselves and and all that maybe they get better reactions i think that's um that's where i took a lot of inspiration from the character was from kurt angle like he's one of my favorite wrestlers but it's he was perfect he was so good i like uh, and they talk about this in the 24 special they did with him is like he you know you've got a guy who's like you know a world class competitor an athlete and he was just so good with like the comedic timing and like yeah. he understood comedy and you wouldn't think that a guy like him would, an would Olympi- get that an Olympian yeah no, no acting experience or whatever and he ends up being fucking better than everyone right? <laughs> yeah like that stuff he did with you know like Edge and Christian and all that kind of stuff like uh, the stone cold stuff with the like little cowboy hat just like he he never took himself 100 percent seriously but still like but still when it was time to be serious he yeah got serious yeah you know, only you could see a, a mean streak in kurt angle and fuck how good was he man like uh it, like he, he in one year before he went, started at survivor series 2000 or 99 and by the next survivor series he'd already won the european title intercontinental title king of the ring and wwe championship yeah. like fuck what a year yeah and it goes to show how fucking good he was uh he like i always loved billy gunn as a teenager and like he's still one of my favorite wrestlers because i thought he was just like a great athlete and good at what he did <clears throat> but like kurt is like he just crazy the guy is like you know the olympic stuff and the novocaine injections and just like the intensity no pun intended but like the intensity that he brought like uh, i don't think we will probably ever see again no yeah, like in professional the wrestling yeah the, the, inte- the, the intelligence as well the three <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> i'm so happy he's back uh, i just i feel bad that they're not really utilizing him no and you know i don't want to see stephanie mcmahon talk down to him 
Kurt Angle. I don't want to see that shit. Um, all right, so moving away from WCW at this point, I want to get back to ICWS. I don't quite know where we're up to with ICWS, but mm. I'm sure we'd already met, talked about Thug Life in the yeah, last exactly. interview. But I don't believe we spoke about your second outing at ICWS. I think it was Halloween Hell 2015, mm. where you took on Strife. Um, so you won outing beforehand. You lost to Ryan and Rex in a triple threat for the junior heavyweight title. And this time you wrestled Strife, which is Daniel Johnston. Um, I was highly critical of the match. Uh, it wasn't a good day, to be honest. Um, what were your memories of that day and the disorganization? Um, if you can't quite remember, I guess I got there at 10 a.m. Yeah. The show didn't start till 2. So that's four hours. And a lot of shit went on during that time. We didn't have a camera. DJ and Gareth had to go get a camera, come back. Then DJ had to put his face paint on. And we're all just sitting there and, and waiting, waiting, waiting. See, I don't mind. I don't. The disorganization stuff didn't bother me, I guess. So, like, I, I, I come kind of par for the course with backyard wrestling, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the thing that that mostly was confusing, and not, not some. I mean, I'm sure DJ could clarify this, but so when when ICWS started back up, and he was talking to everybody, and he'd said to me like, "Oh, I want you to be like one of the top guys." Um, so we'll bring you in um, first match I was supposed to actually wrestle Dante Daniels yeah. he was supposed to make his return didn't happen um, which is fine everyone told me that that was probably likely going to be the case so you know I filled in this match awesome triple threat um, the next show I'm against DJ as Strife um, and he's like oh okay we're you know I'm debuting this new character so we kind of want it to build up momentum so like you know i'm gonna go over that's fine i don't i don't mind losing um i know <laughs> <laughs> but it just it didn't i guess it it was hard to see a way forward like when you come in you lose your first two matches like and you're who you are you're a bigger dude yeah you're a powerhouse I mean, this is what I don't understand, and I don't want to rip into DJ's booking, but he wants to build momentum by beating you, but then the next show, he loses to Deacon cleanly. Mm. Uh, and, and I said to him, after he lost to Deacon, I'm like, why did you lose? You just got to win over... Why are you losing already? Yeah. If you want to build momentum for you and Gareth, because they were a team, yeah. you guys have got to be going over strongly, you know? And that's why I made him film a promo backstage afterward where he beat down Deacon to get his heat back. Yeah. And uh, I just didn't understand why why it had to be that way. But I mean, I think if you were to ask DJ, he'd probably, I would imagine, admit that the whole strife thing maybe was a bit of a, uh, like a failed I project. think I think if you're going to go with something, fucking keep going. Yeah. Because by the second show, which was Seasons Beatings, which ended up being the last of that run of ICWS, he didn't have the face paint. Yeah. He didn't wear the... Uh, the jumpsuit. The jumpsuit. Yeah. He, he, the look changed again. He was back to just being DJ, but he had like a Power Ranger outfit on almost. And I'm like, what are you doing, bro? Like, look, we, we were all a bit like, what the hell? Yeah. But... That can happen sometimes where people do things and you don't quite understand it, but eventually it might grow on you. Yeah. Keep trying. Don't give up on it. Yeah. But I guess it was too hard to do the face paint and all that, and I understand. Um, but, yeah, I just think it was a shame that he didn't keep going with it because, look, we were all a bit critical of it because it was something way different than he'd done before, but nothing wrong with trying something different no. I, d I did I did a gimmick like that in Icy Dub yeah where I was silent didn't cut promos you know I'd been left bleeding by SPWS so now I was going to be like Sting yeah with uh, face paint and uh, instead of a baseball bat I had a crowbar yeah you know a lot of people look at that and say that was a bit stupid and I'm like I don't care I enjoyed it it was something different even if it was only for three or four shows yeah I had fun with it yeah definitely I think <sighs> It's a real shame because I really would have loved to have consistently like had a good run in ICWS just to build and the fact that I'd been there. But you know, when I look back on my ICWS tenure now, I had two matches. I lost both. 
Yeah. Um, and your uh, DJ wanted you to lose a Twister Metal Eight as well. Yeah. Against Steel. Yeah. And I was like, why? He's like, oh, Steel's earned it. Steel's earned a win. And I'm like, fucking hell, man! Like, come um, on! Like, it's nothing against Steel. It's just like you know, give give Blade a win here, you know. But I just uh, um, we'll get to Twister Metal Eight in a bit. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So just um, yeah. It, Unfortunate. What but. was the projections for what you were going to do when you first joined 2015 ICWS? Uh, he said you're going to be one of the main guys. Yeah, so um, I would eventually win the heavyweight title. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Fuck. Um, and yeah, like I, I think that would come about by I was going to end up teaming with you, like because you had like the chaos and an ice kind of situation right. and you would need like a right a oh, second shit. guy that would have been cool yeah and maybe um, they would have brought in the t- tag titles and we would have won them and yeah you, it would have been you, aw- you could have won all the tag titles <laughs> it would have been awesome but um yeah like it just i think dj's booking was definitely a lot more show to show rather than having like a you know three six I, twelve month plan yeah like, i think um because DJ probably didn't know when the next show would be happening. You know? Yeah, exactly. So it's not like with us where we know the show's next month. Yeah. He probably didn't know if it was going to be in two months, three months, four months. Hard to plan ahead, especially when people miss the shows. I think we were a bit hard on him because he didn't want it to be like WZWA where there's all these stories going on. He wanted yeah. it to be more of a wrestling-based fed, and that's fine, but you know, it's not fair for the guys to be complaining, oh, I've got no direction, I've got no storyline yeah it's just like man just have fun yeah you know i complain too why didn't i just have fun yeah yeah definitely and it's something you probably look back on now and just be like oh well we probably should have just made the most of that opportunity of like exactly. being together and, and having fun but you know you can't change it now it, it is what it is yeah and, and i think you know if it didn't happen we wouldn't have had vincent gray's return to backyard wrestling mm-hmm. wicked nick james return to backyard wrestling even if it was just one match Kyle would have never got the chance to be a heel yeah because he was babyface his whole run in WCWA um many things you know wouldn't have happened you know Chaos's title reign yeah he never got to defend it twice before it went down the gurgler the first time he got a fucking solid title reign in there yeah uh, people got to try things for the first time you know something different something fun for them and I think that was that's what ICW's 2015 is to me it's uh just the chance for people to do things they necessarily wouldn't have got to in WCW. I think there's that you know there's tons of positives that came out of it as well. Personally, for me, like I remember uh, Chris slash Rex Regan coming to me afterwards and being like, "I didn't understand why Carl and the other guys were so like high on you before this," but he's like, after having wrestled you, like knowing your capabilities and and knowing like how safe you are and all that kind of stuff, he's like, "I." understand and like getting an endorsement from him where you know chris can be fairly critical of other people yeah um and you know he and i have had (laughs) had a bit of a checkered history which i'm pretty sure we touched on last time yeah um it meant like it meant a lot to me that like he would be like oh okay i get it now like i understand um and you know me and him get along super well now you know we chat i i could totally see him or you know like a jacob or someone like that being a bit sceptical yeah. about yeah. But then when they work with you afterward, they're probably like, fuck, all right, he's actually fucking pretty good. Yeah. Now I get it. I think some in some instances, you don't get how good someone is unless you finally work with them. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, uh, continue on. You missed season's beatings, uh, and that show did improve on, on um, Halloween Hell. Um, I believe you were supposed to face Gareth. Yes, I think so. Uh, Gareth, because I, I just remember the card, Gareth ended up beating Colin. Yeah. Um, just, why is Colin on the fucking <laughs> ICWA show? Uh, but yeah, I was like, why was he against a, just a mask character? And I'm like, he must maybe that was who Blade was supposed to wrestle. So um, I don't think you got to wrestle Gareth, did you? No. Oh, well, that's a missed opportunity there, but oh well. You probably would have lost the match anyway. So. I, I'm pretty sure I was, yeah. yeah. Oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> Um, okay, fast forward to Twisted Metal 8. You yes. were unable to make the show, yeah. but what we got instead was Big Ace Killing Steel, was, which was actually quite excellent. Everyone loved that match. Yeah. Um, you had, uh, your work was moving. Yeah. Yeah, so 
it was just after I'd started, so we were moving in, into new offices, and there was no way I was going to be able to make the show. Um, just unfortunately, sometimes you've got to choose. Um, and yeah, at this point, I was like, no, I, I can't really like say, oh, sorry, I've got wrestling. Like it's a bit hindsight now. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, guys, I'm not feeling too well today. Yeah. Good luck with the move. Yeah, exactly. Um, but. yeah and i think i think you know uh, at least i got to wrestle in icws my name is in the alumni section i i was there i've i had two matches i don't care what the record was um that's all that matters dude you actually got to wrestle there and it was for me personally seeing you walk out to be on an icws show i'm like this yeah Five years ago, there's no fucking way I would have thought I'd be seeing this right now. No, and <laughs> it's just the small things you take away. Like, I remember uh, my entrance in the second show, and I was like, kind of, I wanted to stay sort of within the realm of my WZWA gimmick, but sort of, you know, like with slight tweaks. So I was like, I'm changing my theme song to Fortunate Son by, uh-huh. by CCR. Yeah. Um, and. <laughs> We're, we're wrestling out in the front yard, so DJ's neighbours pull in, and like, so everyone's clapping to the song because it's a fucking banger. I come <laughs> out, and then I hear DJ's neighbours be like, "This is such a fucking sick song." <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, "It's so good." Like, it is. It, you know, I'm trying not to laugh because I'm I'm in character, but fucking hell, like, <laughs> it really is. A sick yeah, song. it's so good. Like, I I considered if WZWA had gone longer, I was thinking about and i made, you know i feel like born in the usa is iconic to my character now but i had thought about changing the fortunate son and i fucking love that song yeah it's a cracker um uh despite only working for icws twice well what do you feel it means to yarding uh, i mean these the icws guys were the ones that carried the torch for backyard wrestling between XCW and WZWA and they have a legacy all of their own um, and to me I always love the parts where you can weave in and, and we did it in WZWA weaving in parts of backyard wrestling history in Perth to these federations you know you competed there for years um, you know Nick had a match there Diffuser had a match like you know as, as many guys as possible uh, the the more we could get in, the better. Um, and, and I love that component. You know, you can get guys who haven't wrestled potentially to come back and wrestle. And I'm like, there's there's still that love for for the hobby, and they 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 made their own legacy. You know, ICWS is just as important to to WA Yarding as WZWA. Or I, I say that all the time, and, and people kind of forget about it because it did go away because of WZWA being once a month and everyone wanted to wrestle in the ring. But I said at the last show in my big final goodbye to ICWS speech, I said, um, you know, look at the guys that came through there mm. and look who... Ended up becoming some of the bigger names in yarding. I mean, Clint Marshall, JD Flame, Mike Del Cano, Daniel Johnston, Dan Zeppelin, Dark uh, Alex Stone, Dark Ice, Kill Kilowatt Ice. Chaos, yeah. like uh, Brian Lowe. Uh, the way that they brought these guys in at first, nurtured them, helped them learn mm. how to be a backyard wrestler. Yeah. Fuck, by the time they got to WCWA, they had it all figured out. Mm. Ryan Tate, holy shit, you can keep going and going and going with all these guys. It's yeah. just, there's so many people that were so fucking good. And, you know, without ICWS, there'd be no WCWA. I mean, they yeah. probably would have done something. But yeah, yeah. They would have had just four or five people and they probably yeah. would have died after a few months or whatever. But without ICWS, shit, we, I wouldn't even know where we'd be right now. And I mean, if you want to, if you want to argue about the relevancy and, and kind of legitimacy of, of, ICWS and the history of WA Yarding there's the GBYWN Hall of Fame and there's only one wrestler in WA that's been inducted uh, and that's Dark Ice and he's he's an ICWS he's an ICWS guy that's yeah. where he came from so I would say just just that fact alone you know considering how big the GBYWS is as a, as a thing and like 
you know how long we were a part of and all that stuff one guy um and there might be two oh really <laughs> fucking yeah, it's uh, officially unofficial ooh um but we'll get to that when we get to it beautiful at some mate point. um right we're getting back to WCWA now yes back to Hardcore Hell 2015 Mm. So this has nothing to do with your match. This is booking committee shit, okay. which is good. We got this stuff peppered in yeah, cool. throughout this interview. Um, you were roped into an uncomfortable situation with John and I. I had this whole story planned for Team Revolution against the ICWS Legends mm. as a final run for John and Nick, a final story, you know, before they bow out. Yeah. I wanted them to just have one story, you know, like instead of just coming in for matches. Yeah. Um, they don't show up at the time they were supposed to and nobody was responding to me. You end up messaging John and he responds to you straight away and says that they're not coming. And I know it's because they drank the night before when they promised me they'd be there. And I was like, please make sure you're there. Don't worry, we'll be there. I was obviously devastated. Um, how did you feel about all of that? Because I feel like when that happened, they lost a lot of brownie points with the boys. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the <laughs> it's really difficult because, you know, John and Nick uh, kind of had so much, have so much respect from the guys, but, you know, the constant no-shows and I guess... Like, people got over the trolling at a certain point as well. And it was funny because when they started to show up to things like the the last Yardie Awards, people actually started booing when they showed up. <laughs> you know, like, they actually kind of have, like, legitimate heat with some of the guys. I think they just, I don't know, kind of jerked everyone around a little bit too much. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I think they did lose a few people's respect which is a shame it's it's sad and I, and I don't want to harp on this too much but um I think when you look back to when they came in 2014 mm. Vic was having consistently one of the best matches on the show I think he ended up being like third or fourth in wrestler of the year um and when John came in for his bits here and there he was very entertaining and fresh and new and different and everyone was fucking wow you yeah. know, this is awesome. This is something different. These guys are really like Carl wasn't bullshitting. These guys are very entertaining, very good at what they do, yeah. and I was very proud of them coming in and showing exactly what the XCW boys are all about. Yeah. But then, as time wore on, I felt like the boys were giving them all the respect in the world and wanted to, mm. you know, be be boys. You know, be one of the boys with each other, you know, have them be a part of the group. But I felt like they always kind of kept everyone at arm's length and they'd stand over here together and drink together and they troll and thread where only those two kind of got the joke. And I think they were a detriment to themselves with that kind of behavior. Mm. And I don't want to see you talking shit about my mates, but this no. is just, this is what happened. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I'm not making shit up. This is really what happened. And, there's some sort of reluctance to really accept all the WCWA boys as their friends. Yeah. You know, whereas the WCWA boys were like, come on, all right, let's be friends. Yeah. You know? But it's like this reluctance from them. And and I think that's where they might have lost them. And, you know, after this situation at Hardcore Hell, it obviously left me very upset and all the guys had seen that. Remembering the fact that I actually changed the date of the show. It was supposed to be the prior Saturday, but it was their brother's... Uh, Bucks party mm. so I changed it to the following Saturday so they could be there so I, I changed the whole date of where 30 people had said they could make it mm. I changed a whole date just for them and they still no showed and that really upset me you yeah. know and they come in at resolution for obviously there's more drama going on behind the scenes with not wanting to lose certain matches or whatever and the match with John and Dan doesn't go well and John's upset. No one cared about my match. That's my last ever match. And I liken it to Mykonos talking to me in, I don't know, it was 2014. He said, no, no, it was early, like early 2013. Why don't the boys like my matches anymore? Why don't they, they used to really love my wrestling. Why don't they love it anymore? 
And I'm like, bro, you do realise that you sit with Eli on the trampoline the whole show and you don't mingle with the guys at all, right? Mm. So if you're not showing that you care about their friendship and you want to mingle and be one of the boys, why are they going to pay attention to your match or care? You, like, friendship is a lot to do with, has a lot to do with the investment that they'll have in your matches. Yeah. People love seeing Steel wrestle because he's Steel. Yeah. People love Big Ace because he's fucking, he's a sweetheart. But then he goes out there and performs. Everyone thinks he's a sweetheart, so of course they're going to pay attention to the match and be like, fuck yeah, good on you. Yeah. So, but when you get to that point, Resolution 4, where you, you kind of alienated everyone to that point, well, why are they going to yeah. Why are they going to pop for your shit? You know? Yeah. So that's just my thoughts. And I don't know how you feel about that. Is, do, do you think I'm pretty uh, on the ball there? Or? Yeah. Because I feel like even with you. Yeah. I, I, this was something I was going to bring I wanna, up personally. It's, it's, the, it's the next question. Yeah. Um, in, in the last podcast, you spoke fondly of Johnny V and what he meant to your career. Yeah. Looking back now, have those feelings changed? I mean, you said you were, he was your favorite opponent. He gave you your best match. Yeah. Um, he spoke to me one time near the end of WCWA and saying to me that he felt like you blew him off when he tried to talk to you at one of the shows. So... What what has changed in the relationship with you, John, and potentially Nick as well? I mean, me and Nick have never never been close, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of that difficulty was um, like he would avoid rest, like he avoided wrestling me. I know throughout the entire time. I just I just said to him, man, I love to see you wrestle Blade because you never got to an XCW, and he just I don't think it'll be a good match. I'm like, why? Yeah, where are you getting that from? Yeah. Like, so it's hard to um, it's hard, sort of hard to quantify with Nick. I think maybe in the entire time I've known him, we've had maybe one one honest conversation, right. um, when he was telling me that he was getting hurt wrestling, like with his shoulder and stuff. Um, right. And we, the, it's probably the one conversation we've actually had where I think he confided in me. Um, John, I'm really surprised that he thinks that maybe I fobbed him off because, I don't know, I was with people I consider better friends, um, which might be harsh to say, but um, I don't I know. Th- I can't remember. He just he, he came up to me and said, oh, I tried to talk to Blade earlier, but he just didn't really seem interested in talking to me. I don't know what's going on there or something like that. I, I honestly can't recall. Um, and again, like, you know, me and John probably have never really had an honest conversation either um and i do still you know i do still hold him in high regard as a backyard wrestler um as a guy that you know much like ryan elevated my career at a point when i needed it to um you know i think he's a decent guy i just i don't know we've never really i guess connected as friends and i've known him for but why yeah, I don't know. I don't understand why there's the, the, that not that connection there. Like, I would have thought when, you know, you guys, you guys all came in in 2014. I just envisioned like a, a, a an XCW crowd section where we'd all be hanging out together. It's like, man, this is like old times, but with beers now. Yeah, you know, we'd have Hydro there and stuff. But even then, even with Hydro, it felt like Nick didn't even really fucking pay attention to him. I don't know why. I don't get it. Yeah, we're all old friends. We did it for years. Why is it different? Like, and it was awesome with with Hydro because like I you know actually talked to him and like got to meet his girlfriend and you know she was really nice and like all that sort of stuff and uh, you know we had conversations and like those those are things that I thought would never have happened um, in his instance it was great um, it's just like why isn't there an embracement why aren't they embracing an old friend I don't get it I just I never understood it uh, I embrace you yeah more than anything <laughs> I just don't understand it. Yeah. And I mean, that's... Uh, you know, it's completely different. Then you look at a guy like like Bonner, um, who I've known for the same amount of time, and he has always given me, you know, as much respect, I think, and as much of his time as he would anybody else. Well, he was else. the same with Homicide. Yeah. He, he, he would always pay attention to him, talk to him, but none of the boys ever... Yeah. No one else did. No wonder he wanted to leave, you know? Yeah. And I was, I was guilty of that too. Yeah, it's um, it's a shame, but you know, to me, they they're still such a hugely important part of what we've done and, exactly. and the legacy and stuff. Um, but you're right. I think in the in the long run, they definitely did 
a bit of harm to their legacy. It's a, and it's a shame, but yeah, you know. Well, I, I'm glad to have got the the lowdown. I thought there was some sort of heat with you and John, but no, there isn't. Okay, well no. that's that's good to know. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the next question was never getting to work against Nick Ariel despite my attempts to make it happen. Um, we've already kind of gone over that. I mean, it's just disappointing. I just don't understand what the big deal is. I mean. He, he was fine wrestling everyone else I booked him against. He didn't really want to wrestle Hydro. And I'm like, why? It makes sense. You guys had a feud back in the day. Let's rehash it for one show. Yeah. You know, just for one little thing in his backyard title reign that actually had a story behind it, whereas everyone else was just because they were feuding with the EA. So. Yeah. Um, oh, well. We'll get off them now. Um, and uh, Hanukkah Havoc uh, is the next show. You have another great match. Uh, as you work against Dark Ice for the very first time. How's that outing for you? Because um, at this point, it's the big push to Resolution 4. Yeah, so... It's really hard, because at that point, I hadn't wrestled uh, anybody like Ice. Like, he, he was another, he's another big guy like me. I hadn't really wrestled like many big guys at that point. It was yeah. like Jack, Monet... Kyle, Deacon, Dan, Dan, Big Red, <laughs> like, you know, old guys that I could, you know, throw around with relative ease. So then when you get in, a, in the ring with another behemoth, um, it, it's always, a, to me at that point, it was always like a bit of a question mark, like, shit, what are we going to do? Um, and I mean, the match ultimately ended up getting interrupted by people coming out and was kind of like setting up for the, the Battlefield for Brawl. Battlefield yeah. brawl. Um, the typical match where I'm winning the Battlefield. No, I'm winning the Battlefield and then they try and throw each other over the top rope to show that they can do it. Yeah, like, and I, I, like... Fuck's sake. But it was great because it planted a seed in everyone's mind that like, even though they only got to see, you know, six or seven minutes of me and Ice go at it before it was interrupted, you could see that there was... A chemistry there and that there it was, was just a taste yeah and i knew like I, I i guess i didn't really know until uh, christmas carnage what actually was going to happen after you won the belt but you were going to have a little thing with ice and phaser yeah um which we'll get to uh as we get to it um but that was you know the taste and i knew that we we're going to revisit that later on definitely uh, especially with how good the match went, I was like, "Fuck, these guys really work well together, and they're bumping hard for each other." You know, I think he gave you a rock bottom and all this stuff. So yeah. Um, so were you still feeling the pressure at the time to keep your game stepped up and knowing that you're winning the belt? Yeah, I think, and I think this—it's a constant theme throughout my entire run was that I was always putting pressure on myself. You know, always wanted to have the best match. Uh, you know, always wanted to make sure that people were enjoying my match enjoying the character you know I didn't want to get to a point where any of it was old because at that point you know it becomes a, a sort of thing where you know oh well maybe we need to move away from this because it's not not working or, yeah yeah so I think having had that match with Ryan and then following into Ice who's another guy that also everybody respects and, and has a lot of love for um yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I was definitely nervous. A lot of nerves, a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, uh, the next thing is just a comment. It was like as soon as you were the All American Australian, you became 10 times the rest you had been for the prior 14 years. Um, that gimmick seemed to really help you spread your wings and be a better Blade Shaw. I think um, I think it's finally reaching that destination of being just a hundred percent comfortable. You know, you like you, and we've all done it, especially those of us who have you know wrestled in backyard wrestling for you know fucking decades and a half. Um, it's you know there's always a different like iteration around the corner, and sometimes they don't work. Like you were saying, with you know people were criticizing you for your ICWS Aston Crude Sting sort yeah. of approach and strife with DJ and you know heel Jack and uh, with the face pain and Mykonos with the face pain like there's all that you can look at everybody's career and probably say oh there was a time where this just didn't work and like 
It was like me 2015 before I'd uh, be become the hitman thing. Yeah. I was uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do. I was a baby face and I was coming out to shout at the devil and I was like, what even am I right now? Like, I'm in Team Revolution, but what am I? Like, I was so... I'd been a heel for so long and now I was, like, so uncomfortable. And there's just a, there's just those, I think, for, for people, there's that gimmick where it just, like, snaps into place. Oh, God, the Hitman thing. F thank fuck I thought of yeah, that. Yeah, and, and, you know, for me, for me, looking at you, like, that was a career renaissance, oh. like, sort of thing, you know? I was looking at, like, Jericho when he reinvented himself. Like, I've got to think of something here. I've got to do something completely different than I've ever done. Yeah. And, and, and it worked. And for me, I think it was just the same thing. I finally found, like, the gimmick, the 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 comfortable sort of situation that worked for me and allowed me to sort of portray my strengths um, and, you know, to, I guess the rest is history. Bingo. Um, Christmas Chaos 2015. I want your side of the story here. I have, This is one of those stories that I've told so many times on the podcast. Yeah. The drama with Jack that morning when he posted in the thread at four in the morning saying something bad has happened something personal has happened mm. the show might not be going on tomorrow yeah i woke up at eight o'clock i read it i messaged you and i said i'm going to be at yours in the next 15 20 minutes i got up splashed my face grabbed a can of red bull sped down the freeway to your house picked you up dropped you at Jack's because I knew once someone was there the show must go on I messaged everyone in a private message saying I don't care what he says we're all going there he's not fucking us over this time Yeah. because Zibby was leaving for Texas and um, <clears throat> Alex was fucking already on a train on mm. the way to, to the show and I had to go pick him up from Whitford's to hide him upstairs in Jack's for the surprise return there was all these things that was heavily relied on to happen on that day because Ryan was going on holiday for a couple of weeks after that to Tasmania. Yeah. Like, it had to happen then and there. You can't fuck us around, bro. <laughs> so your side of the story, what do you remember of that? So I remember pretty much as you said, you messaged me. You know, I, I, At this point, I think I'd read Jack's message as well. So I'm like, yeah, fucking, here we go. Awesome. Um, so you messaged me. I'm all cool, awesome, get up, get ready, you pick me up, you drop me there. I was kind of standing downstairs, and I think, uh, like, maybe it was Jack's uncle, or somebody else was down there, and I was like, oh, where's Jack? And they're like, oh, he's upstairs in bed, and I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> so to me, like, when I was thinking about the situation, I'm like, okay, like, there's going to be some tension and then and then the ice needs to be broken somehow how am i gonna do that so i go upstairs jack's in bed and i'm like so i i jump into his bed and lay next to him and put my <laughs> arm around him and he wakes up and he's like what the fuck and he like looks over and he's like what the fuck are you doing in my bed and i'm like hey bro <laughs> um and we just like start having a conversation he's like fuck off cunt i'm like yeah cool man like what's going on so we just started having a conversation and like the ice was was broken um i think i mean i don't want to say i was savior of the show but like that would have helped i think it relieved probably a lot of the tension that would have occurred was it true that he admitted to you that nothing bad had happened yeah like he just i think he'd had a big night and it kind of been like oh, I can't he's be posted fucked. in there at four in the morning yeah. and he's been out all night yeah and the amount of times I told him if you're going out go home a bit earlier you know the show's on don't fuck it around man it's yeah. just gonna cause problems yeah so he did admit to you that oh I just had a late night and yeah fuck's sake <laughs> so I was fucking so upset that day over it it was probably the worst it had ever been except for 2016 which we'll get to yeah um Tell me your side of the story about how Tim Justice shat the bed that day in his big return and his final appearance in Yarding. Uh, like, it just... You've got this you've got this stage set where somebody comes back, and I mean, to me, Tim is an unknown entity. Yeah, I talked to him a couple of times at shows, but like, I hadn't seen him wrestle or anything. Um, 
comes out and like he starts cutting this promo and the promo is woeful whenever anybody uses swear words to in a promo it's to cover up the fact that they can't talk like it's it's just terrible um so he starts swearing and you know anybody that knows Noel Wallace knows you don't bloody swear in his house you fucking donkey like, exactly like fucking hell it's a live <laughs> microphone it's, it's it, pretty loud yeah and so yeah, <laughs> he's cutting this promo and then you just hear this like voice above all else just be like oi and you're <laughs> like and we all know it's big null so like the audience at this point is lost like we're all pissing ourselves laughing at Tim getting chewed out by Noel in a live promo that we're filming. And we're just like, shat the bed as an understatement. Like, that... (laughs) I don't know, if I was in his position, how I would gain anybody's, like, interest or respect back in what I was doing. Because you're you're fucking laughing stock. You got told off by someone's dad. Like... And After coming out all guns fucking blazing, tearing into Antilochus, you're a washed up piece of shit. Yeah. Whilst he's holding the WCWA yeah. title and his tag partner's got the Aussie yeah. title, it's like, mm, it could be more relevant, mate. Like, and like that line, that's a good line. Yeah. In any other instance, but not that situation. You made, you made yourself look foolish that day. Yeah. Um, Chump. Christmas Cars 2015, Alex Stone returns mm. to Santa Claus. Your thoughts on, on seeing Alex get back in the saddle? Uh, this is all the, you know, the booking committee yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, I love... Uh, one of the biggest things that I regret about WCWA is not getting the opportunity to wrestle Alex. We kind of briefly touched on the Battlefield Brawl, but, like, I just... Uh, such a good character. Awesome dude. You know, like, had his in-ring style down pat. Um... I think if we ever did a reunion show, that would be the match I'd book. Yeah. Uh, unless Justin is in town, then it'll probably be Justin. Yeah. Alex. But uh, I, I would have loved to have seen him. It makes sense that that match would have happened, because of, especially during the Elite Alliance days, because you fucking wiped him out with a chair in your debut. So yeah. That is a shame. Um, but he, uh, yeah, I always loved seeing Alex come back, and like it was really hard seeing him go uh like when he decided that he kind of wanted to focus more on his music and the other things were going on in his life at the time um you you kind of like i looked at him and was like wow this guy is like on top of his game and he's about to go Um, he's leaving when he's right at the at the peak yeah and it was yeah to me it was like it was a shame but uh, you know, like, getting him to come back and the involvement that he had kind of, like, in the last couple of years there, you know, we still got to see his face fairly regularly and, um, you know, he contributed when needed um, yeah. and did it to the degree that you would expect from he someone was still, of his caliber. He was, didn't matter how long it was, he was still bloody good. Yeah. Yeah, and when I wrestled him at Hostile Backyard Showdown 2017, it'd been, like, fucking nearly three years since I wrestled him last, which seems crazy, but it was, and we still had the same chemistry. Yeah. If not better, it was probably one of the better matches we ever had as well when it was improvised. Fucking, that's how good <laughs> Alex is. Yeah. Um, another one, Christmas Chaos 2015, Brandon Cage returns to be in the brawl. Mm. He hasn't been in WCWA for a year and you two had prior heat. What did you think about me giving him another chance? Um, uh, I think it was fine. I mean, even with people I've had heat with before, like, I'm never going to go out of my way to sort of alienate people. I just have always maybe had one or two people that I just don't get along with. So to me, I guess that was pretty inconsequential. Like, oh, okay, Brandon's come back. Like, Carl, obviously, wants to give him another chance. That's fine. Like, let's see, you know, what he can do, what he's going to bring to the table. Um, and, you know, if at the end of the day, if he really wanted to come back and had something to prove and, you know, wanted to make it up to the boys, then, you know, I am... I don't think anybody is in a position to say no, really. Even after all the shit Tim did, I still was giving him a chance to be at the final show. Yeah. So, fucking hell, I'm a bit of a softie. <laughs> um, was there still any heat with you and him as time wore on? Uh, yeah. I mean, you're you're aware of kind of the final conversations that, that he and I had towards the end. Um, yeah, what was the go there? I, I think he just... I, I think it was his way of trying to sort of 
bridge the gap and say like look i know we've never really like gotten along but like i just want you to know that i respect like what you've done um and uh sort of i guess it was his way of trying to sort of bury the hatchet a little bit um and and be frank about the situation and i mean despite the fact that he probably brought it up like one or two many times <laughs> like he said it like a couple of times to me and i was like i, I, I get it like I'm not not an idiot, um, but just like a, kind of laying it to bed, and I, I I have a lot of respect for people that are willing to sort of approach me frankly and say, "Hey, Blade, like I know this has occurred between us or whatever, blah blah blah." Um, you know, let's just like friends, peace, whatever. And uh, to me, that's cool. Um, you know, I've gone and seen him like at his work. He cut my hair, um, right. <laughs> uh, gave me a discount, sick cunt um and yeah like we had a chat i was asking him about how like the training with schwa was going and and all that kind of stuff and yeah like we're on you know when i don't think we're going to be best friends um but you know we're on speaking terms and that's good you know if i saw him in the street i'd stop and have a chat unlike uh, vonnie too honey. yeah no uh if he was hit by a car i wouldn't stop I don't think. <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, battlefield brawl time. Jack still trying to get the show to end as soon as possible. Mm. Really was pissing me off. Um, but we don't need to go into that again. We've already kind of gone over that. But fucking hell, it's just all day. It was just like, man, we've got to get the show done. I've got to go. And it's like, fucking... I went and asked Noel, is it okay if Jack leaves and we finish the show? He got tickets to a festival and he forgot about it. Oh, well, he's a dickhead then, isn't he? You know, yeah, I don't care as long as you clean up. I was like, fucking all this time Jack makes a big deal out of Noel needing Jack to be there at all times and he just he didn't give a shit as long as it was clean at the end of the day yeah um, but finally we get to the brawl you enter as number one in what I regard as the best battlefield brawl we ever did uh, the prior year was pretty good too when Mykonos won um, you win the brawl after eliminating Phaser and then Ice this was obviously a huge moment for you mm. yeah um uh, it was just it was a lot of fun like i'd i'd missed out the previous year because of work um uh and then so i was really excited and coming in at number one is is tough it's tough because you're in there from start to finish um so you really need to to pace yourself and so there's a lot of I guess a lot of rest points for me. So it, when it's clipped together, it's funny because you don't see the full full thing. So if you look at probably like the the recap on YouTube, you'll see me like sitting in the corner, <laughs> just like fucked because I've you know been in there for like twenty minutes at this point, twenty five minutes. Um, but yeah, no, such an such a pivotal point because that's where everything changes, right? I win win the battlefield brawl i'm now the number one contender out comes antilicus and that that's the start of a a whole nother story yeah that's brilliant and you know phaser hitting the angle oh, slam on you yeah the phase out as i like to call it yeah was that pre-planned so the three of us are there and he's like i want to do this so he grabs ice angle slams huge him. huge pop yeah him. and then so I go to rush him and then he grabs me and you just hear this kind of like there's like a baited silence almost and then as he lifts me up people are like what the fuck and drops me and then it's like yeah he like you know is pumped up and he's like yeah like the crowd is losing it and you, you would think at that point like shit maybe FaZe is going to win the fucking yeah. Battlefield Brawl um, yeah so we've, uh, we've been trying to build him up as well we wanted to make it look like anyone could win that year you know just yeah. to kind of swerve everyone I think the last show he'd knocked down Tilkas down and grabbed the title and held it up to end the show which was really cool um, but fuck that that ankle slam I remember when, he, when you guys bumped I couldn't see you guys for a second the ring went down so much <laughs> when you guys bumped it was like what the fuck it was like you guys went into water yeah. and then, but then came back up it was like the, the bump was so big I'm surprised that it wasn't like a big show choke slamming Undertaker through the ring yeah. because the, the impact was huge um, oh, what an athlete yeah what an athlete it's a shame that that was kind of like his last thing before he came back for his backyard TV against uh, Zibby yeah um, I really had big plans for him going into the, the next year 
Um, Line in the Sand is the next event, and I can't remember who your opponent was supposed to be. Um, but in the end, Hydro ends up, like I think the day before, saying, yeah, I'll come wrestle Blade. Yeah. Do you remember who it was? No. It no. wasn't Three Dog. No, no it wouldn't I... be because he was against Antilochus. So. Yeah, and he was. He ended up being replaced by Esquilito in a different match. Yeah, that was on. yeah, that was later so, on. So, yeah. Um, Fuck, yeah. Just... No recollection. I don't know who it was supposed to be. Any, I was hoping we were going to figure that out, but I just maybe it was Alex. Yeah, that was potentially. That might have been it. Yeah. Fucking hell, Alex. <laughs> uh, Hydra accepts the match, so like it was good because this gets to make up for the Clash of the Tries match, which went very short because he'd already been through a, a six-man tag. Um, and it ends up being his final match, and I think it was actually a really good match. Um, what were your thoughts on... Um... Yeah, it was so much better than the first one because this time, you know, I'm not gassed from having like another match and then going into another one straight away. And... Uh... I kind of I was more aware of what he was capable of at that point and I was getting more comfortable in kind of leading and dictating matches like I mean, up until that point I'd never been like a, a match general or a ring general you know yeah. I never called spots or or anything like that but I'd, I'd started to gain confidence so you know I was like oh you know go up and do you know your elbow drop and you know kind of I, I was the one that had set up the ending and all that kind of stuff, so... He catch the crossbody and then turn into yeah. the end of days. That was sick. Um, and, yeah, it was awesome. We we ended up having, I think, like a pretty solid solid match. Yeah, and that ends up being Hydro's final match. Um, uh, I'm, I'm proud of him for mm. coming back and, and doing the little bits that he did. Yeah. It was, it was good, and I think everyone loved his promo before the match. I mean, that was hilarious. Oh, God, that, that was the worst part of the whole thing. Coming out, <laughs> coming out and feeling shit. like you're going to shit yourself <laughs> is, like, the worst feeling. That's, that's every Mykonos match. Yeah. <laughs> you, you always need to do a poo. Yeah. Oh, man. What were you thinking as you are about to come out? You're like, oh, no. I said to Lily, because... Um, we're, we're, What's she thinking? Well, yeah, we're, so we're standing backstage, and um, I'm starting to, like, sweat and oh, get, right. like... I, I think my face kind of, you know, gave away how I was feeling. She's like, you all right? And I'm like, no, nah, I don't feel feel so good. And so I'm like, whatever, we just got to gotta do this. So I go out, and as soon as I walk out, everyone's like, Blade! And then I'm just like, oh, fuck, and just, like, oh. run off. And then it's like... Everyone's like laughing. You're like, what the fuck? And then Hydra is still on the mic. Yeah. Goes, See, they're all scared. <laughs> <laughs> he really did well. That yeah. was such a great pro. He never spoke on the mic before, and I never knew he was that good. Otherwise, I would have had him do it a bit more. But it makes it makes sense. Like with all his, like yeah, I know he did a lot of acting, yeah. like in, in his spare time and stuff. Like he, yeah, like just naturally comedic and very good. Um, yeah. And I was, I was happy to see that match take place. Uh, the feud with Antilochus begins. Before we get to that, what were your thoughts on Jacob's title reign from the booking standpoint? Um, uh, when when you look at all the people that have been WCWA heavyweight champion, I'd put him near the top for sure. Yeah. Um, just he... Uh, such a talented kid. And... Uh, I wish he had had more confidence in his own ability. I wish uh, because... he wasn't so fucking hard on himself yeah. and say, that was shit. Because of one little thing going wrong, he would hate the whole match. Yeah, I think he um, uh, he just had so had so much talent. And I wish he could, had considered you know going uh, into the pros, because I think he could have done. Yeah. Could do. Uh, pretty well there. Agreed. But... Yeah, yeah he just, I just wish that he really uh, was able to... See what we saw? Yeah, exactly, because he was fucking good. That's why he was the champ. That's why like, I cut his hardcore title reign short. And I said, bro, we have to get you away from this thing and put you as WWE champion because you're the best thing going right now. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just need to change course real quickly because it's, it makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, rest of the, oh, sorry. What did you want out of this feud with Antilochus from day dot? So, because I know that we were planning on it going for quite some time. Um, 
three or, well three or four five months ish kind yeah. of thing. Um, so what were you hoping for from the get go? I'd said to him at the previous Yardie Awards because uh, you know it had come down to like the final three for Wrestler of the Year was me, him, and Monet. Yeah. Uh, and Monet ended up winning, and and you know he had had an amazing year. Yeah. But you also kind of look at it from the perspective of like, well, shit, like, you know, this guy's like the heavyweight champ. He should be wrestler of the year. Like, yeah. Uh, and so I said to him, like, I, I want to ensure next year, you know, that either your number, you are wrestler of the year or that we create, you know, this, this thing that people remember and, you know, like, you know, it sets up a legacy of like, oh, like, Blade versus Antilicus is like one of the Ice versus Regan, yeah. Rude versus Alex Stone, yeah. Like, what are the fe- Monet versus Mykonos? What yeah. are the feuds that really fucking uh, are remembered? Yeah, you know? Edge, John Cena, Rock, and Austin. Yeah, Blade, Shaw, and Antilicus. Yeah, and um, I-, I wanted to make sure we achieved that because I said to him, you know, with the knowledge of of where this was going, I said. You know, you're elevating me and and doing this for me, so I want to be able to give back in some sort of way. Yeah. Um. And yeah, that, that's what I wanted to do. Um. So resolution four has arrived. This is your second resolution. Literally the biggest day in your yarding career. Take me through your day. <laughs> um. So. You wake up. You chuck a shit. Yeah, probably. So pretty standard. You check your phone on the toilet, see what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I probably, you know, posting messages in the Facebook group. Um, so you know, like I, I kind of, I have this idea of like how I wanted things to go, um, and I ended up changing some of that at the last second. Like I, I had this little like, uh, I called it like the USA segment where I was supposed to like. You know, hit the dusty road elbows and the shake and bake and like fucking, all oh, right. Yeah. Um, the like Hogan leg drop and the angle slam and like, and, 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 like at the time I was like, oh, that that'll be really cool. But I just uh, as it got closer, I was like, no, like this, the the build up I guess to the match had been serious. much more serious, and I feel like I would have been like out of place. Um, I really want because I wanted you to tear the shit yeah, out that's right. Well. We were gonna have like the Hogan. Um, shirt ref but it just it didn't I don't think it would have fit no um, and in, in, in hindsight it's a good decision yeah um, so we scrapped that and then I kind of still had a bit of fun so I clipped together like all those uh, like American. American wrestler themes and uh, Team America World Police the America fuck yeah thing yeah, and yeah. like uh, like so I still had a bit of fun but um Oh, it's one of those things, especially, you know, something I would come to realize over the course of the last year was sitting there and um, you're waiting for your match and you're the last match and you watch all these people go before you and, you know, they do all this crazy shit and so people are hyped up and the expectations, you know, are growing and growing and growing and then it gets to your match and you're like, oh shit, like now I have to fucking be better than all of those people. Mm. Um, and the thing was, it was... Yeah, <laughs> it it, uh, it got the same amount of votes as Phoenix versus Three Dog, which is why both matches were in yeah. voting for match of the year. Um, so before we get to the match, uh, we've heard about your day so far. Uh, Resolution Four drama, mm-hmm. the John and Nick situation, obviously was. I want to know what you th- were thinking from your position when. You found out that they weren't happy about losing their matches. I think it's a bit... I mean, it's fucking backyard wrestling. Like, I just, remember Nick eventually saying to me, you know, I don't really care about if I win or lose. Yeah. Like, yeah, I get that, but why still make a big deal out of it? Why annoy me with it? Yeah, yeah. You know I've got 20 other people to worry about. Why do I have to like have these conversations with you guys to make sure these matches happen? Yeah. I think, it, you know, for Nick, it's probably just more so... Uh, a way of pissing you off and but John wasn't happy I know he wasn't actually happy because he said to me you know I don't I don't wrestle very often 
I'm supposed to be this legend, right? Like, I come in and I, and I just lose. I'm like, well, dude, fuck, you haven't lost a clean match since you've been here. Mm. You lost to Monet by... You beat Monet by DQ because he slapped the referee because I didn't want Monet to beat you yet. Mm. Uh, Alex Stone beat him, but that's because Monet hit him with a Jara kick. Yeah. John beat me at Resolution 3. Yeah. Even though John said, you should win. I said, no, I think the right thing to do is for you to win, just to elevate you and keep you on a pedestal. Clash of the Triads, he didn't get pinned. I did. Uh, him and Nick went to a double count out. Uh, he hadn't lost yet. Yeah. He hadn't actually lost, and I didn't think it was a big deal that he would lose to Dan Zeppelin, who I feel is on the same par as him as a legend. Yeah. I remember watching WrestleMania with the XW boys, and John said to Bonner, you know Carl had me lose to Dan Zeppelin at the Resolution event? And mm. I'm like, what's the fucking big deal, dude? <laughs> yeah. Like... <laughs> he had a problem with it, and, and, and the match wasn't good. No. Uh, it, like, and the, this is the thing... I feel bad about that. You know, I feel like I should have been referee to keep giving them... Like, feeding them. Feeding yeah. them ideas as it went along. Like, guys, you've got to pick up the pace here. You've got to do something. Yeah. You know? Dan, hit your flurry of of kicks and, and uh, sent on splash that little bit that he does with the running clothesline. Yeah. Yeah. John hit the cool dog. John hit the fucking V straight. Yeah. John hit the V wiser. Whatever. Like, yeah. I, I should have been referee. Yeah. It um, it's really unfortunate. You know, like when you put two guys who have such like a their own storied careers and then the the whole thing doesn't pan out. I would have thought it would have been a tremendous match. Yeah. I think it's really difficult as well because. I just I don't agree I guess with John's uh, position on the whole thing like to me if you're a legend you come in to elevate others like that that's you know look like Triple H when he when he wrestles like he can't like he comes in to put others over you know Reigns even though I hate the cunt um Rollins Rollins uh, Batista yeah uh Daniel Bryan John like, Cena yeah he did it to it for everyone yeah and I mean like <laughs> that's fucking Triple H so you know, I, I think it's always been a position. You know, Undertaker losing to Brock was just to elevate Brock to another, a whole another level. Um, and I mean, sure, they bungled that because it's WWE. But the the whole point is like you come in to um, enhance, you know, the current platform of of that wrestler. You know. Yeah, and and the thing is, like, after what happened at Hardcore Hell, this is. <laughs> They had to do something to make it up to the yeah. boys. They had to put someone over. It's the right thing to do. And we've all, we, well, I mean, most of us have had punishments before. I lost to Stacy when I had no showed, and yeah. you know, like it, you know, it. You do it because it's the right thing to do, and you you've made a mistake. Like, exactly. That's just part of the business. Resolution for craziness, <laughs> the debut of Phoenix. Yeah. Crazy. What are your thoughts knowing that the guy from back in 2002 that you fucking mucked around with at the old AWL arena, <laughs> um, what was it like seeing him come back after all that time? It just, like, it takes you back to another time. You know, like, seeing him, I was like, shit, man. Like, you know, this is a guy that I'd had sleep over at my house and, like, you know... Um, you know, had talked to him through like him losing his girlfriend at the time because like one of the other guys that the NAW guy Biohazard, I think his name was. Yeah. Fucking slept with her. Yeah. Um, uh, and like going to his place for his birthday party, um, you know, with my girlfriend at the time, and it was like just crazy, like stuff that I hadn't thought about. I didn't for, even like, know that you've gone to like, parties and stuff. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, me and him um, for a while there, like we're pretty pretty close, like good reasonably good friends right yeah it's just crazy seeing him go out there and be the crazy fucking guy that we remember from XCW being like fuck like, this guy's so hectic like, yeah he's so unpredictable and that match with three dog was just like brutal defining yeah. for hardcore wrestling in WCWA I mean that jump off the wall and everything I mean <laughs> What were you thinking when you saw him jump off that fucking wall in the neighbor's yard? Well, I, prior to that, you know, we're moving around the arena as you do, like talking to people between matches. And, uh, like I walk over to the empty lot next door and I see him with a sledgehammer breaking up the ground. 
where they're going to set up the table. And he's like, oh, i got to stuff, you know, I'm trying to soften it up for, like, when I hit it. And I was like, fuck. So, I, you know, I'm watching him, like, go up and, like, stand on the ledge and kind of look over. I'm afraid of heights as well, so there's no fucking way that I would have ever done that. No, no um, and I'm just, like, looking at him and, like, you're, like, in a way, that cunt is tapped. <laughs> like, like, you have to be to be able to do stuff like that without you know, thinking too much about it, and, you know, like, props, it's, it's, you know, it's something insane that I would, would never think about doing, but the guy's entertaining as fuck, he definitely knows how to, um, to put on a hardcore fucking clinic. Agreed. Um, alright. It's a long day, but we finally get to the main event at 10pm, how are you feeling just before going out there? A bit like, pretty nervous, so I'm sitting back back there with Jacob um, and his girlfriend, and we're kind of chatting, and you know he's going through some last minute things, and then you know it kind of gets a bit soured because I remember at the time Jack was like, "We got to hurry up because we've got to be finished by like ten thirty. So you know it's it's not one of those instances where it's like, "Oh shit!" Like you know we need to do this, we need to do it quickly. Like you don't, I guess, really get to stop and appreciate the moment as much. Um, certainly not as much as it would at the last resolution. Um, so, still, um, you know, just, it's always that point. It always before my matches, I'd go up, I'd get my gear out, I'd sit down, like I had my, my own little, like, kind of ritual, I guess. I'd sort of, you know, go into a bit of a reflective state. Right. Um, yeah, I would just get, like, so in the zone, I'd get so, like, worked up I think about like making sure that I was you know going out there I was hitting all my cues I was you know you know not botching or having as little botches as possible you know like just all that kind of stuff like it yeah was difficult at times uh, how do you feel the match went really fucking well um, the funny thing is is like it didn't make me look amazingly strong you know for most of the match I was you know taking a beating yeah and I only kind of got the rub at the end um but I think it has told such a good story of like you know you've got a heel who's so desperate to like hold on to you know what he has um and you know he's willing to do anything to, to hold on to that um, Even align himself with Jack Wallace. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, he's like, <clears throat> I'll grab anyone at this point. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just Jack's Jack. Um, and I think it just it worked so well because we played into the psychology of the show before, where he'd um, put the chair around my leg and like jumped on it from the top, and we played to that injury a lot, where he, you know I went for the super kick and he grabbed my leg and like swept it out and yeah. I think we we worked that angle like so well, and that like you know we kept everybody anticipating, you know. Like, I just remember hearing like all the time like, "Come on, Blade, you can like you can do it." Like get up, like people were genuinely people were actually invested. Yeah, yeah, they wanted to see me get up and like and and win. And so when, you know, I hit the thing and I got my uncovering Jacob and the three hits, and I you can see me people are, like looking like you were having a fucking heart attack because I kind of stuff and I'm like. And then, like, I just fall, like, onto yeah, the mat. Yeah, yeah. And it's, like, in shock because, you know, it's the biggest moment of my fucking backyard wrestling career. At this so, point. You, mate, you have the realisation there, I've just won the heavyweight title. Yeah, like, that's... I, and I, it means something. Yeah. Because it's been how long of a journey? That 14... 14 year, years. 14 year journey to fucking win the champ... Win a champ, big championship. Yeah. And it's just huge because, you know... The, the, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was thinking about, you know, in XCW... Up until Highway to Hell 2004, you'd built yourself up for ages. You had the thing with John. You had tag team with O-Factor. You were tag team champion. You were TV champion. You'd finally built up and you beat me at Highway to Hell. And then the following event after that, you were supposed to wrestle me in the main event. But of course, XCW didn't continue uh, in that kind of run of storyline. Yeah. So that moment where you were going to be main eventing a show for the championship at least that didn't end up happening and then when we come back for XCW you know there's only a couple shows here and there through the years you eventually come back as the on-screen owner yeah 
um, for Halloween Horror 2007, and we're going to have a few shows. We're going to have some stories going here. And we got to a certain point, but then, you know, it kind of went away again, but then 2010 began, and then you missed that first event, but then you came back and you built yourself up again. You had that great match with Diffuser, great match with Chris Rowe at Christmas Chaos 5, just as you're probably at the point there where you'd be moving up a bit further, XCW's now gone. Yeah. So, like, there have been moments where you've almost been, you know, on the cusp of, of like, a main event type spot, and it didn't get to happen. But now, finally, after how long was it? Fucking two years of being in WCWA, yeah. now we actually finally got to that destination of you becoming the heavyweight champion. I just wanted to make that point of, of how that journey went yeah yeah it was um it was a long process so getting there in the end and um uh lily had bought a whole bunch of like red white and blue streamers for people to throw in so people were like tossing those into the ring and 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 i made sure don't let blade know that we're doing this yeah so then like chris Rowe was there and i was like here's some streamers you know and i was handing them out during the match you know just to some people um Actually, no, I think as the match ended, I was like, here, here, we're throwing streamers into the ring, and the red, white, and blue streamers are coming in. I mean, that must have been a special moment, man. Ah, uh, it was so awesome. And, you know, like, having the red, white, and blue ring ropes, and, like, it, it just, like, it kind of showed that it was, like, oh, man, like, the fact that people are willing, you know, to do this and, like, participate means that, you know, like, I hold a special esteem with these people, and yeah. I don't think that's something that everybody can you know, say that they have with such a, a large group of people, you know? Yeah, and speaking of that, obviously there was an emotional moment after the match when uh, I got on the microphone to really show my appreciation for you and I started to get upset. And I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> like, last year you cried because you are in character. This year you're actually crying <laughs> because you're proud of your friend. What were you feeling when, you know, I was on the microphone talking and I started to get all fucking choked up like that? Um, it's just, it's touching, you know, like, to see a friend who cares so much about you and, you know, has been such a a big part of that journey and process and, you know, and you, you and I through WWA got extremely close, you know, way closer than we were ever at XCW. Exactly. Um, oh man, it, it, you know, at that because I felt like we'd done this together yeah yeah exactly it was something that we had come up with together um, and to see you know I guess the fruits of our our labour and you know creative work sort of come together in the way that it did you you, you can't manufacture those moments they they either happen or they don't exactly Um, and the induction into the hall of fame I mean it's all coming at you once yeah yeah you know I win the title and it's like oh also you're getting inducted into the into the backyard hall of fame no that was awesome and getting inducted with Chris you know who I had my last XCW match with him going at the same time um, was really cool uh, and you know what can I say I'm you know in company with you know the best across Australia you know and well deserved too I think you I think you were the lead votes in that class. Either if if you weren't, you were second. Yeah. Um, and Chris snuck in at fifth, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, so the last question for this section, I'll probably end it here because we're at an hour and a half. Yep. Um, cool. Part two will happen, and I'll have another episode in the can, so we won't have to worry about eleven more episodes. I'll have to worry about ten. Um, how are you feeling being WCWA champion? Um, I mean, I, you know, you kind of have spoke of it right now, but yeah. what do you really feel like, fuck, I fucking, I achieved this, I fucking made it? I think it's the the thing that really, like, set it in stone was uh, was when everybody gets into the ring and you, you kind of got every person individually, like, comes up to you and is like, oh, man, like, I'm so happy you deserve this. Like, I love you, man. Like, it just... Because you had John and Nick there, you had Chris, you had Bonner. Yeah. They're all there. Yeah. And uh, I made a point to say that, you know, I'd love for you guys to be there for Blade. Yeah. And it just, it, 
you know, having guys that I've known there for so long, and then you know, guys that I've become such good friends with. Stacy was point. there. And, yeah, yeah, you know, like it just, um, it meant, yeah, a hell of a lot. You know, when I think about all the things I've accomplished in my life up until this point, um, it ranks right up there. And you yeah, know. your brother there. I mean, fucking. Oh, my awesome. whole family was yeah, there. Family. My mum, uh, my sister. Her partner, um, yeah, my brother. I was seeing Jake start crying because I was crying. Yeah, she was like, yeah, she got in the moment as well. Yeah, you know? which is funny because you know she finds the whole wrestling thing pretty goofy, but um, I, you know, I think she also knows as well like how important it is slash was to me. Um, that's a thing. Uh, I, you know, it's just at the end of the day, I don't, I don't even think it's about the wrestling necessarily or the titles or whatever. It's just human beings showing appreciation and love for one another and yeah. that's like that's I said what it's all about. you can't you can't manufacture that it's it's all genuine exactly and uh, but I don't want to thank you for part well it's technically part one of this interview but I think we're up to like part five now yeah. in the grand scheme of things but thanks Blade uh, love you bro the, the usual handshake love you too and we'll be back with part two in just a moment thanks guys for listening to the GBYWN Australia podcast We'll be back with Blade for the next episode for the remainder of his backyard wrestling career. Thank you.